wait a second, maybe I need to finish it. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Thank uh, you. Yes. It says you're still sharing the screen. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay. Stop sharing. And now I try to get you rules. Uh, oh, I don't see. Oh, yeah, I see you. Just order for everyone. Report, report. Oh, yeah. Okay, you can see me. Okay? Yes, uh, we can see you. Maybe try to put up down. Yes, yes, everything, everything is work. Very good. Let me just. Yes. Wow, <laughs> nice <laughs> picture. <laughs> yes, let me just, uh, I'm going to start recording. Yes, too. yes. Uh, I will try to record it. Okay, maybe... very good. I'll just let you record it then. If, if I can, of course. If I can, of course. Yes, I can record on this computer yes recording in progress okay so thank you very much for inviting me to present this lecture i always regard it as a privilege to be able to do this especially for you students and professors under such difficult situations that you're facing uh, i hope that this presentation will be a sign of our commitment to people outside of ukraine from people outside of ukraine to support you not just uh, uh, by words, but by actions. Um, I'll talk today about the, the final lecture that I prepared on the project that we call Distributed Drug Discovery. And it's gonna involve, well, it has involved students throughout the world. And I'm hoping that someday it will involve students in Ukraine, perhaps at uh, Taras Shevchenko uh, National University. Um, I'll begin by, in a somewhat unconventional way, of uh, telling you the origin of this project. Uh, I worked at Lilly for many years, 27 years in drug discovery chemistry, and uh, decided to go into academia back in 2002. Uh, shortly after I went into academia, as I was thinking about how I could bring my unique uh, understanding of, of the drug discovery process into an academic environment, this uh, tragedy occurred in, in uh, the uh, destruction of the Columbia space shuttle as it was coming back to earth. Uh, uh, some of the uh, tiles fell off and it disintegrated and all these uh, astronauts unfortunately died. Uh, but there was this picture on the front page of our paper the next day showing the astronaut, astronauts that were there. And the inspiration uh, that this gave me was I looked at these people and I realized uh, in many ways this whole space exploration took place because they had coordinated all their different uh, talents and disciplines to bring this about. Not only that, but it also represented in at least a superficial way, a diverse representation of, of people uh, in many different uh, ways that we look at diversity. So I looked at that process and I said to myself, boy, that was wonderful that we could bring these people together. And just like an in industry, um, you, to solve these kinds of problems, you need multidisciplinary efforts. In the case of space, uh, things, uh, engineering, communications, all these things that I show here. But what I, I realized that is in the pharmaceutical industry, we also had this core need to discover drugs that drove the interdisciplinary working of, all, of, of multiple scientific disciplines. So that was one thing that was just sitting in my mind as I saw that picture. Uh, the other thing was that at Lilly and in pharmaceutical companies in general, we spend very little effort trying to find drugs for diseases that affect large numbers of people. And this isn't because uh, they're, they're bad uh, people or that they don't care about these people, but it's a, a simple function of the economics that industry is gonna spend this money trying to find drugs to treat people that can pay them. And so uh, the tragedy is that there's large populations of people who aren't uh, the uh, subject of this drug discovery uh, research process. I just give two examples here. Uh, one, leishmaniasis, this is a disease that's 
very rare in the United States, but prominent in many other places in the world and, and still uh, undertreated. Uh, another type of population we call orphan disease. This would be represented by this child with cystic fibrosis, uh, who, uh, you know, it's a genetic disease and it can be fatal, especially if you get a, a nasty infection from bacteria, one of which is called Pseudomonas aeruginosa. And I'll tell you a project that we are involved in to try to find drugs to treat Pseudomonas aeruginosa infections. So those were the two things that were kind of sitting on my mind uh, when I came up with this concept, which I'll call distributed drug discovery. And the idea was, okay, now instead of having exploration out of outer space, the, the core um, goal that would bring people together, how about if we put uh, discovering drugs to treat neglected and infectious diseases at the core, recognizing that now we need all these various disciplines to bring about um, uh, drugs to treat these diseases. And in particular, since I'm now in an educational environment, I wanted to bring education and humanitarian concerns, things that I couldn't do at Lilly into the, the mix of different things that are applied to try to find these uh, drugs for neglected diseases. Now, we don't have the resources uh, at, at IUPUI, Indiana University, Purdue University, Indianapolis, and many schools that would be required to, to be involved in this drug discovery process. So the concept that I worked off of was the idea of distributing the problem solving. So unlike having a centralized resource like a, a Lilly or a Merck or a Pfizer or other pharmaceutical companies, we would look at certain stages of the drug discovery process and try to split up the, the problem into small pieces that could be now distributed to multiple sites in, in this vision in terms of the chemical synthesis. Uh, if we had a, a fairly large number of molecules that we wanted to make, what if we took that large number of molecules, broke it up into smaller bits, like 10 molecules would go to a particular school here, 10 to another, uh, 15 to another. IUPY, we've got a pretty good capacity. We could do 20 molecules. And, and that way distribute across uh, schools and schools across the world, the synthesis of the molecules that have been selected as uh, potential uh, targets for drug discovery. This would involve students that are simultaneously being trained in chemistry the way we normally are in an organic chemistry lab. But at the same time, the products from their, their work are not going to be put in a waste disposal can, but they could be new molecules if we're clever enough in designing the kinds of chemistry that they can do, uh, that these new molecules could now be the potential drugs to treat these diseases. So now if, if that's been successful at the distributed chemistry stage, now we've got a large collection of molecules for screening. And in a similar way, perhaps we can develop simple biology labs that students in multiple schools could carry out to test those molecules. And they learn the basic biology that's behind the, the disease target. At the same time, they're testing the molecules that the students across the hallway perhaps have uh, made for as those potential uh, drugs to treat those targets. So that, that's the simple concept. Now we have to get into the practicalities of actually carrying that off. So I'm gonna take pick this off kind of piece by piece and discuss this overall distributed drug discovery program and, and core components of, of it that make it happen. Uh, if you've uh, seen my previous lectures, you know that I'm a combinatorial solid phase chemist. And I believe in the process of being able to make lots and lots of molecules that are potentially the molecules you want for a particular target. And then when you have those, assembling them into a large virtual catalog, which then is available for computational expert analysis to figure out which molecules to make. So the challenge in D3 is to be able to make large virtual catalogs of molecules that are accessible, not just by expert chemists, but by students who are just learning synthesis for the first time. And so if that's possible, then they can participate in this, this distributed uh, chemical synthesis stage. So we've, we've spent a lot of time trying to develop what we call D3 basic chemistry research to enable the construction of these D3 virtual catalogs. Those catalogs being different from other virtual catalogs in that the procedures that are required to make the molecules in those virtual catalogs are simple, reproducible, powerful, 
inexpensive, uh, safe, can be carried out by students anywhere in the world. So that's, that's the idea. Let's look at this first stage going from uh, directed uh, basic chemistry research to the virtual catalogs. So we envision this as taking place in a number of different stages. First, we've got to show that we can take something from the literature, um, a, a good uh, solid phase chemistry, since we're going to focus on solid phase chemistry. If you work it out, it's, it's something that students can really easily uh, carry out. So that's why we have a focus on solid phase chemistry. So can we take literature solid phase chemistry procedures that are combinatorially based and show that we can now reduce those um, experimental procedures to something that students can carry out in a regular organic chemistry lab. So that's the first stage is to develop these and, and enable the synthetic chemistry. Then once we have that in place, we do the classic work that combinatorial chemists do. Uh, we look for the compatible reagents for those procedures. And then, um, then we um, rehearse them. And then when we got them available, we use computational tools to enumerate all the molecules that are possible based on those synthesis labs, based on the available reagents, and now create these large D3 virtual catalogs. So here's an example of how we would do that process. Uh, Dr. Marty O'Donnell and I had published away, a ways ago in the Journal of American Chemical Society, a pretty simple procedure to take a starting benzophenone imine bound to solid phase of glycine bound to solid phase resins and convert it in a series of steps to unnatural amino acids bound to resin beads. And, and this is a simple alkylation procedure. We have available all sorts of different alkylating agents to do this. But the key being now we can make not just natural amino acids bound to polymer beads, but unnatural amino acids bound to polymer beads by this uh, solid phase chemistry procedure. Our first D3 lab, the one that we're going to show students can carry out in multiple places, was to do this alkylation and then acylate, uh, make an amide bond between a carboxylic acid and that amine to make this derivative, then cleave it from the resin bead to get simple, acylated, unnatural amino acids. That was going to be our first D3 lab. And just to show you that this, the equipment is really quite simple. Once it's solid-based chemistry, you can have a simple reaction vessel. It's a glass tube. There are other ones. Uh, my good colleague, uh, Victor Kirknack has some very clever uh, equipment that can be used also in the solid-based synthesis from his company, Torvi. But anyway, the key is that there's this uh, uh, little white frit here that prevents the bees from going through it. And that's all you need to be able to do multiple steps of the solid-based synthesis in this reaction vessel and to carry it out. Um, it, we do it six at a time. There's a drain tray to let things drain out in between, in between individual steps. And then eventually when we are collecting the material off the resin beads, we, we put this on top of that and uh, cleave the molecules from the bead and they end up in solution in those vials. This just shows some of our students at IUPY doing it, uh, multiple steps of washing, adding reagents, uh, letting them react. Uh, washing away the, the materials, um, preparing for the next step, um, adding the next series of reagents. But I just want to point out here again, we are dedicated to uh, things being inexpensive because we want this, the, these uh, procedures and the equipment to be able to be done at schools throughout the world, not just at IUPUI where we have relatively good resources. So here's an example. We don't have a lab jack. We just took two pieces of wood nail them together to get the right height to put this thing up above so that uh, when things are being washed, the dra it drains out in the beaker and, and it's done. So that's an example of a D3 lab that we have carried out. Uh, the question is, uh, how are we going to identify reagents to use in that D3 lab and how are we going to then uh, computationally enumerate them in the virtual catalog? So I'll just show you one of our first uh, representations of, of uh, deciding what alkylation, uh, alkylating reagents to use in this procedure. And this is just a partial list of 100 different uh, alkylating agents or Michael acceptors that we put together for this lab. Question is, can we show that these things are actually going to work? So we thought our first example of distributed problem solving would be to re rehearse these reagents in schools throughout the world. So we set up a simple rehearsal lab to rehearse the R1 axis that are going to end up as the, the reagents to go into this position. So here's again 
that laboratory. Now, instead of putting on a simple uh, ACL group, we actually put on an FMOC group. That's a standard protecting group in amino acid peptide chemistry. But the, the value of that here is, let me just make sure this pointer stays on all the time, visible. Okay. The, the idea here is the FMOC group has a really good chromophore, so it made it easy for us to look at these things, the quality of the molecules made by various analytical techniques. So that's the lab that we're going to now distribute. And so this is an example of just some of the uh, products of that rehearsal, where we made these molecules, all of them having the FMOC group, as, which will be our chromophore to make it easy to, to identify the purity by HPLC. But you see some of the simple alkylating groups that we looked at here. And what you see here is that the, the uh, LCMS purity of the molecules that were made as an average by students in Poland, Spain, and the United States. So we had uh, students at all three of those sites making the same molecules and then comparing the results and averaging them. And you see that the, the, these are pretty good uh, results uh, in terms of replication. We can go into detail some other point about the the reproducibility and the statistics and all that. Uh, I th don't show you some of the reagents that didn't work, but of course there were ones that didn't work and that was the whole point. And then we eliminate those from the ones that we're gonna use to enumerate a virtual catalog. So that shows you some of the alkylating agents. We didn't do a rehearsal of the acylating agents. We're pretty confident that um, just using our good chemistry sense, we'll be able to identify what molecules will do well in the actual formation of an amide bond in the next step. And this just shows you some of the molecules that we picked from the literature, from, the, from various um, commercial sources. We did some kind of analysis here to make sure that there was some reasonable variation, clustering the molecules by various techniques in the groups and then picking from a given cluster of similar uh, carboxylic acids, just one uh, uh, of those uh, molecules. From that, we, in, we identified 100 uh, carboxylic acids, 100 alkylating agents, and we went about enumerating a catalog from that. So now we've got these reagents that have been rehearsed or that we have good common sense are gonna work in a procedure that we've shown works in multiple labs in students' hands across the world. We computationally enumerate those into a catalog. Now there are all sorts of different ways to enumerate uh, uh, molecules uh, combinatorially. Um, we used a very powerful program, which is now not available, called Afferent. But we also used ChemAxon software, which we like. And the reason I am particularly attracted to the, those two pieces of software is that they're reaction-based. And as an organic chemist, I like the idea that you can just write out a sequence of reactions it, computationally and then pull in reagents at each step and have it create the molecules that would come out from that synthetic sequence. There's simpler ways of doing this, which are just basically cut and paste of the R1 groups and the R2 groups into the molecule, but they're not as powerful chemically in that you can sometimes predict molecules that could be made based on a cut and paste, but which wouldn't be compatible with a particular reaction sequence. Um, so anyway, uh, by the way, you may note here 100 R1s and 100 R2s. If we're a true combinatorial chemists, 100 times 100 gives you 10,000. Why am I saying 24,000 plus for our virtual catalog? Well, you get 10,000 from the combination of these two things, but we also get a mixture of the two enantiomers at that position. So that's two, two of the different enantiomers. So that's two times 10,000 or 20,000. And then some of these alkylating agents and some of these R2 groups had another asymmetric center. So we get diastereum is all, you know, variety of other isomers out of that combinatorial process. So that's why it's a 24,000 plus D3 virtual catalog. This just shows you a few examples of the molecules that are present in that D3 virtual catalog. Again, the critical nature of a D3 virtual catalog is that these molecules should be accessible uh, by simple chemistry, inexpensive, reproducible chemistry that can be carried out by students as part of their chemistry educational process. These are just some of the D3 laboratories that we have in place. Again, they look pretty simple. This is the first one that I described. But if you look at the molecules, they, they do have some sophistication, um, uh, just representative molecules from that 
and just another series of molecules. These are labs that we've shown our students can reproducibly carry out. Reproducibly means we make sure that another chemist in the lab, uh, in a different lab, makes the same molecule in the same reproducible fashion. And at that point, we call it a D3 lab, and we're ready to take it to schools outside of the United States or in the United States. The last D3 lab uh, I wanted to focus on, this is a lab that was developed by a colleague of ours, Amelia Fuller at Santa Clara University. And it represents one of the things that we really are hoping to embed in the D3 process. And that is have our other collaborators who have their own chemistry. There's just a ton of really good combinatorial solid-based synthesis in the literature that isn't being put to use. And so the idea is take these solid phase procedures and, and have somebody like Amelia Fuller uh, develop them into their own student lab to show that they can make molecules reproducibly of their, these are areole peptoid type molecules, her, her specialty. Uh, and then we can work together and have yet another D3 procedure. So we're, we're looking for other collaborators that have their own interest in their own synthetic procedures, but also a dedication to reducing them to reproducible, simple, inexpensive, powerful procedures that now enable larger and larger and larger D3 virtual catalogs. So at that point, uh, we have the ability to make these large D3 virtual catalogs. I won't discuss this process. There are many ways to go about subsetting those molecules into the ones that you actually want for a particular disease target. The point I want to start out here is once that process has been done, we can still have from maybe a, a large, say a 10 million compound library, large library, uh, a, a pretty large number of molecules still to be made. This could be hundreds of molecules. We're not intimidated by that if we can then distribute the synthesis of this, as I mentioned at the beginning, where you break up that large number, hundreds of molecules in the smaller subsets of 20, 10, 15, 20, you know, five, depending upon the resources available at a particular institution and their interest, make those molecules and then have them available for screening. So um, that is the idea of what's going to happen here. And I'll just sh uh, show you a few, few uh, fun uh, pictures of some of the students that have been involved. Obviously, we have our ones at IUP involved, but we've done it in Lublin, Poland. My previous wife, who passed away in 2002, and by the way, that's part of the, the, the soup of, of uh, what am I going to do with my life going into 2002, 2003, and that picture that led me to the D3 program. And so obviously, we take the D3 program to Lublin, Poland, and how wonderful researchers there, students there. We've taken it to Mexico City. We've taken it to the University of Havana just a number of the places uh, uh, that we've gone outside of the United States, Barcelona, Czech Republic, Olomouc, uh, Palatsky University, Krakow, uh, we have a collaborator uh, there at the Jagiellonian University. And the, uh, uh, these students are just wonderful, it's the same all, all over the world. And that, that's a special pleasure for me to be involved in this project, to have contact with the students that are involved in the D3 program. So that's just the kind of fundamentals to have in place. I'm gonna talk about in the rest of this presentation, the two projects where we've applied this process to try to find the drug to treat a neglected or an infectious disease target. The first disease target I'll talk about is cystic fibrosis. Cystic fibrosis, that was the child, the orphan disease that I talked about at the very beginning, affects a small population of people. And again, because it's a small population, there isn't the financial incentive that you would have uh, in a traditional, pharmaceutical industry to define drugs to treat cystic fibrosis. Well, we came across an article uh, back in 2010 where uh, researchers at Harvard had reported that D-tyrosine, very simple molecule, the unnatural isomer of tyrosine, not the uh, L-tyrosine, uh, but the D-tyrosine was able to inhibit the uh, formation of biofilm by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. It either inhibited it or it, prevent, uh, it accelerated the destruction of the biofilm, both of which are important um, features of an infection by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So we looked at that molecule and we said, boy, that's pretty simple. We already have in place chemistry 
from that very first D3 lab to make all sorts of analogs of, D, uh, of D-tyrosine. Uh, we make a racemic, but if we identify the active enantiomer, then we, we can know whether it's D or, or L, S or R in this particular orientation. So we decided to make a whole series of simple analogs of tyrosine or phenylalanine, where we'd have different halogens off of the aromatic ring, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine at either the two, three, four position, and sometimes at multiple positions. And this is the simple D3 lab that we, we conducted to make those analogs. It, it, it's identical to D3 lab one, where we do the alkylation work to make that introduce unnatural residues here, uh, cleave off the benzophenone imine to make the unnatural amino acids bound to resin beads. But unlike D3 lab one, where we now isolate that nitrogen, we now have a, a resin bound unnatural amino. So we just cleave it from the resin bead to make these molecules here. And if they're aromatic halides, benzyl halides that we're using in this alkylation step, we can get all sorts of aromatic unnatural amino acids uh, synthesized by our students. So that's the procedure we carried out. We did it where we um, had as an alkylating agent, uh, a bromine or chlorine at this position. And the R1 was, as I mentioned before, either fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine at one of the three positions and sometimes at multiple positions. And um, we would use that and we got, get these final, after cleavage from the resin, unnatural amino acids as a mixture of the two enantiomers. So there we had the lab. We made lots of those different derivatives in our students' hands. How are we gonna test them? So we developed a comparable D3 biology lab, simple and expensive, powerful, that would allow the students in biology to learn biology around, well, microbiology around bacterial growth. But at the same time that they're doing that, they would be putting in some of these ba growing bacteria samples, samples of the molecules that the students had made uh, in their chemistry lab, and they see if they would could inhibit the formation of biofilms by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Here's just a slide showing you the simple uh, a kind of uh, assay that our biology students did. This is just a 24 well plastic dish, plastic well. And uh, we had in rows A and B, we would put um, test compounds, either one, two, three, four, five. So we could test six different compounds made by the students and uh, we test them in replicate in rows A and B. And then rows C and D, we would have controls. Well, I should describe to you how this assay works. So we put in the plate, well, we, the students, put in the plate all except for the last two wells. They put uh, a uh, broth containing the growing at Pseudomonas aeruginosa bacteria. So they put that first in the plate. Then they come back and after the bacteria is in the plate, they put in, columns one, two, three, four, five, six, the th six different molecules that they're gonna test. Again, replicated in rows A and B. And then rows C and D are done for um, uh, our controls. So for example, uh, this well here had just bacteria by itself. Nothing was added to it, just the bacteria is allowed to grow. After the bacteria is allowed to grow, it forms a biofilm if everything's going normally. And that biofilm can be stained with crystal violet, and that's what gives us this, this nice color. So anything that shows this color here tells you that the bacteria has grown, it has formed biofilm, and that biofilm is now stained by crystal violet. So these two wells here are not stained. That means the bacteria didn't grow, and if they didn't grow, they didn't form the biofilm, and the biofilm wasn't stained, so it's clear. Uh, but media alone, of course, should be clear. The bacteria by itself should have the color, and then we have other molecules that we know inhibit the bacteria as positive controls to indicate that, that biofilm formation was inhibited, uh, even if it had uh, the bacteria were trying to grow. So that's a simple assay. So we took this assay, we had hundreds of these plates because we got hundreds of students in biology in one of those labs, and, and they and tested in replicate the molecules that the students in chemistry had made in replicate. And what we found out was that there were only Fought four of the 20 molecules that showed any significant activity against Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and they were all fluorinated derivatives. If it were iodine here, 
but bromine, chlorine, they didn't have activity. But these molecules at one to five micrograms per mil inhibited the formation of that color, i.e., in other words, of the growth of the bacteria and formation of biofilms. We were pretty excited about this and also pretty naive. So we went back into the literature at this point and, and looked at uh, the, for the existence of these molecules and what kind of uh, activity they had. Uh, we found out that, in fact, uh, well, back in the 40s, late 1940s, the parafluorophenylalanine had been made uh, and not only been made, but had been tested against Pseudomonas aeruginosa and shown to inhibit the growth of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So we hadn't uh, discovered this ourselves, we just rediscovered these fluorinated analogs as being potent inhibitors of bacterial growth if you don't have phenylalanine around to, uh, to, to antagonize that growth. Um, that was still exciting, but the thing that wasn't so exciting was that in the literature, it also was shown that these molecules are quite toxic. So here we had something that was able to uh, inhibit the growth of uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, inhibit the biofilm formation, but also was going to be toxic. So that's not going to be a drug. So we, we looked at this, again, if you uh, listen to my first lecture, you know that beyond the simple testing in an in vitro assay <clears throat> or even a cell assay, where you identify something that looks good at this stage of a screen assay, you're well away, <clears throat> excuse me, well away from coming up with a molecule that's gonna be a drug because there are all sorts of things that can be a problem later on in the drug discovery process. In the case here, I'll just focus on toxicology. I mentioned that these fluorinated phenylalanines are toxic. And the reason they're toxic, as best I can understand from the literature, is that they look a lot like phenylalanine or they look a lot like tyrosine. And they take the place in the metabolic pathways that, these, that the normal amino acids uh, fulfilled. And instead, sooner or later, uh, they, even though they took place in these metabolic pathways, they ended up being uh, turned into something that was non-functional and that led to the toxicity. So we decided to have now a distributed project that we take out to our, our colleagues in a number of different schools to see if we can get around that toxicity. So the project became, how do we find drugs to treat cystic fibrosis based on these fluorinated phenylalanines that are non-toxic? So I'll talk about a pro-drug approach. So here it is, again, the fluorinated phenylalanines three, two, three, four fluoro and three, four difluoro that we identified as being uh, toxic to the bacteria. The concept in pro-drug research is, can you turn a molecule that is, has at some point some desirable properties, in this case, toxicity against the bacteria, disguise it in some other form such that it won't have the toxicity that you have in the, uh, the molecule itself and that that uh, a disguise form will not be un, un, will not be uh, revealed as the uh, the molecule embedded within the disguise form will not be revealed except by something that's unique to the target organism. So here our proposal was: why don't we make a dipeptide derivative of the fluorinated phenylalanine, and we'll have many different natural amino acids here, but of course. Later on in the project, we can have many unnatural residues here. This will be the, the dipeptides that we test. And the understanding that gives us uh, some reason to believe we could get some selective toxicity from these molecules is, first of all, we know from the literature that Pseudomonas aeruginosa has very specific dipeptide transporters to help take in dipeptides into their cells so that they can use this as starting materials for their own synthesis of uh, uh, peptides uh, by degrading the dipeptide into the constituent amino acids. So uh, if the Pseudomonas ceruginosa has these specific dipeptide transporters, maybe we in our mammalian cells don't have the same dipeptide transporters and uh, as a result, uh, won't take these molecules into mammalian cells. So that's one possible avenue for selectivity. The others that we know again, from the literature, that bacteria have peptidases that are unique, and uh, many of them are not uh, uh, similar to uh, mammalian peptidases. So another potential uh, way of getting specificity is perhaps 
once this is taken into the cell, the bacteria has a specific peptidase that will cleave that. And um, unfortunately for the bacteria, convert it back into the toxic chlorinated phenylalanine. But in the case of mammalian cells, maybe we found a dipe unique dipeptide that is not recognized by our peptidases, but is re still recognized by the bacterial specific peptidase. So it's a very simple hypothesis that we're gonna test. So here's the D3 lab that we developed, uh, very simple. In fact, it, it could be just a, a, a peptide synthesis, dipeptide synthesis lab in general. So if ever we want to make dipeptides for whatever purposes, this is a lab that we show our students can carry out. Undergraduates who have never done synthesis before successfully carry out and make molecules. But in this case, we put on an unnatural amino acid on the cap here. And now when we cleave off uh, the material from the resin, we cleave off a Bach protecting group and we get the trifluoracetic acid salt of this particular molecule. So we have 20 different natural amino acids that could go here. We have four different fluorinated phenylalanines that could go here. We're combinatorial chemists and think about all the different possibilities and want to make them and test them. So that's 20 times four. And what you get is this particular grid. So the, it may look, it is a lot of molecules, but if you just look at the, the different uh, squared uh, portions of this grid, you'll see that every molecule in this particular grid as a two fluorophenylalanine. The difference is in the uh, amino acid side chain, which is glycine, alanine, valine, et cetera, all the way through 20 different amino acids. Then we get another set of 20 different unnatural dipeptides where it's a three fluorophenylalanine all the way through. Again, all 20 different amino acids, four fluorophenylalanine, and then the three, four difluorophenylalanine. So this became our targets for distributed synthesis. So we assembled a bunch of our collaborators uh, who were interested in taking part in this. And we started to have our students at Santa Clara, Goshen College, uh, IUPUI, uh, Colorado College, uh, make subsets of these molecules. And so that's still in process, but just to show you the power of distributing this amongst multiple institutions, at this point in time, all the molecules in blue have been made and purified by our collective group of, of uh, researchers at these multiple institutions. We still have yet to make the ones in red. And if you look carefully, you, you might see why. This one actually has a two fluorophenylalanine and it's uh, a cysteine. Cysteine is kind of a, 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 a problematic amino acid in synthesis because of its potential to make dimers and get oxidized. And so that requires perhaps a little level of more a particular attention than we would have in a regular undergraduate laboratory. Likewise, the indoles have some issues with uh, how you cleave them from the resin, uh, giving uh, uh, cations that can end up adding to the indole ring. But so here we have 61, have we made already 61 of the total 80 molecules that are targeted. And we're in the process now of doing the biological evaluation of these in that simple biofilm assay to see which ones are active. And then after that, we'll look for ones, we'll look, develop an assay for mammalian toxicity um, and see if we've now been able to accomplish our goal of selective toxicity by virtue of them being prodrugs in these uh, dipeptides, unnatural dipeptides. So primary uh, colleagues in this research have been uh, Amy Downey at Colorado College, Santa Clara University, Amelia Fuller, Doug Church at Goshen, and then of course, we're doing a lot of this work at IUPY. But we've also involved students in Mexico um, and uh, another place in Indianapolis, University of Puerto Rico, University of Havana, have shown that they ha can do the procedure that has, is now being used to make these sets of uh, unnatural dipeptides. Well, the last project I'll talk about now is one of uh, extremely current interest, not only to the general population, but turns out as of last Tuesday to me, because as I was preparing for last Tuesday's lecture, I started to get a sore throat, a cough, and the next morning I had a, a decent case of COVID with a, a headache, a cough, sore throat. Um, and I'll tell you how that story has ended uh, at the end of this uh, presentation today. Obviously, I'm doing pretty well to be able to be here talking. 
So in 2020, uh, COVID came about. We were in the middle of one of the, these D3 labs with the Pseudomonas aeruginosa target, and we had to shut down our laboratories. And while they were shut down, uh, we decided to come up with a, a new project to look at potential drugs to treat COVID-19. So I'm gonna show you how we and many others have looked at this problem of trying to come up with a drug to treat uh, SARS-CoV-2 the, the cause of uh, COVID-19. And I'll just look at a few of the stages of the replication process for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. The one that I think almost everybody in the world is familiar with, uh, not in the technical detail, but in the idea that if we can make antibodies to the spike protein that's coating the surface of the virus then have those antibodies bind to that spike protein, it can block the first interaction of the CoV-2 uh, virus with the cell surface that it, uh, the cell's gonna infect. And we can get these antibodies either by getting infected ourselves, by challenging the body with uh, uh, a fragment of the spike protein, which is the way that these RNA-based uh, uh, vaccinations take place to cause our bodies to make that spike protein, or we could actually manufacture antibodies to those spike proteins and administer them. So there are a number of different approaches at this level, but, and, and they've been, you know, have reasonable success. Um, what I'd like to focus on is what happens after the virus gets into the cell it's infected. And the RNA that's released from that virus codes for really long polyproteins uh, just designated schematically here, PP1AB and PP1A, that are going to become the precursor molecules to uh, all, all sorts of non-structural proteins that are required by the virus for its replication. And what is critical in that replication process is that the, the, the virus has got to be able to cause the polyproteins to be split into the smaller proteins that are embedded in it that are these non-structural proteins. And that process occurs by what's known as proteolysis. And there's a key enzyme that the uh, virus uses. It's called main protease or MPRO for short, which is going to be the enzyme that's going to chop various bonds in these polyproteins to generate the smaller essential non-structural proteins. So that's clearly a, a, a very um, promising site for inter interrupting the whole virus replication process. So let's look at what's going on in that virus replication and the processing of the process polyprotein. So here we have that polyprotein, huge polyprotein embedded in it are proteins A, protein B, protein C, and protein D. These are gonna be the ones that, that the virus is gonna to wanna to have excised, chopped out from the large polyprotein to generate the individual uh, proteins that are uh, required for its replication. The main, prote main protease goes along this large polyprotein and looks for very specifically a glutamine residue. The glutamine residue is its key. If we go back to my talk about the drug discovery process and think about locks and keys, this is the key that's going to fit into the lock of the active site of the main protease recognized and at that point, a thiol group in the main protease is gonna come in and start, initiate the process to cleave that bond. So at every place in this polyprotein where that cleavage is going to occur, there's gonna be a glutamine resin right before the amet bond that's cleaved. In many of the locations in that polyprotein, not only is there the glut required glutamine, but there's also a leucine. That's not strictly true in all places for cleavage, but, uh, as far as I can understand, the majority of the cleavage sites also has a leucine residue. So these become part of what we would look at as the key that fits into the lock of the active site of MPRO and might be a clue to what we might wanna to do to come up with a drug to treat uh, uh, COVID-19 by blocking that main protease. So I'm gonna look at it again, a little bit more detail. Here's the polyprotein. Here's the required glutamine right next to the amet bond that's gonna be cleaved. Here's a leucine residue. And what researchers did and published in 2020 um, was they looked at this key portion 
And they said, let's make a, a whole series of molecules that mimic the glutamine and perhaps even the leucine residue, recognizing that they will be, be pulled into the enzyme active site and then we'll attach to them what I'm going to call a hook. I call this the bait portion, but we'll attach to them what I call a hook. And the hook is going to be sitting out there waiting to grab on to the thiol group and make an even tighter bond. So the combination of the bait for recognition in the active site, the key portion into the lock portion of the active site. And then to make it a key that you can't remove, basically, have a, a bond formed between uh, a key thiol group in the enzyme and the aldehyde portion. So that became the beginning as one of the first uh, representations of a potential a molecule to inhibit MPRO and treat uh, COVID-19. Just less than a year ago in science, we see a culmination of that work in, the, uh, in a research presented by a scientist at Pfizer in science on their, their route to the discovery of near Mitrelvir. And you'll look here and you'll see this molecule. They, yeah, there's the key again. Everybody seems to be keeping the confirmationally restricted glutamine now. And there's some chemical reasons for that in terms of reactivity, but they all have this, this confirmationally restricted glutamine, but you can see why you know, it mimics glutamine. And then they have either leucine or something that has embedded in it the, the basic structure of leucine like here. And so these were two of the early uh, uh, parts of a structure activity relationship to come up with a drug to treat uh, COVID-19 by inhibiting MPRO. But the culmination of that was in the drug near Mitrelvir, which uh, is the active component in uh, a drug called Paxlovid. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But what Pfizer did was they, they, they kept the glutamine residue in near Mitrelvir. They pretty uh, extensively disguised, but it's still there, the uh, leucine residue. And then they put on some very unusual groups here. And you got to remember here that this region is a little bit more uh, amenable to variation than the, the, than the almost uh, totally required glutamine residue and, and the leucine-like residues. And this gives them an opportunity to explore other properties of the molecule in addition to its ability to inhibit the enzyme because it's not sufficient to just inhibit the enzyme. You got to make sure the thing's bioavailable, doesn't de get degraded or all sorts of other considerations. So this part of the molecule actually may afford uh, uh, opportunity for improving the characteristics of the molecule in terms of the pharmacokinetics dynamics, its interaction with things in the body at the same time to preserve the ability to bind to the active site of the enzyme. And they now use a different hook, a nitrile rather than an aldehyde, but it performs the same role and reversibly forms a bond to the thiol group and that makes it a very tight inhibitor. So, as I told you, um, I got COVID uh, a week ago. Uh, really, it's kind of hard to imagine. But yeah, a week ago, I got COVID. And I called the doctor. And since I'm over the age of 55, I'm a candidate for Paxlovid. Uh, the people who take Paxlovid, it reduces their uh, likelihood of ending up in the hospital by about 80%. So that seemed like good odds to me. So I called my doctor. I got a prescription Paxlovid, uh, opened up the various doses. And this is what I get, and this is what I've been taking. I stopped taking it. It's only for five days, so I stopped taking it yesterday. And uh, uh, within one day, I felt really pretty good. The fever was gone, cough was gone. Um, the uh, other symptoms were, were basically gone. It was just a sad, bad taste in my mouth from the drug, basically. So that's you open up these packets, and you see these two pills uh, in it, which are actually the active ingredient near Mitrelvir. But if you look at the packet, there's a third pill. And that's what makes it interesting and reminds us that this near Mitrelvir is not the end to the discovery process for drugs to treat COVID-19 by inhibiting MPRO. That pill is a very different molecule. It's ritinavir, which actually was uh, first discovered as uh, for use as an HIV protease inhibitor. But one of its properties is that, that it inhibited some key metabolic enzymes. And one of the problems in the discovery process of near Mitrelvir was that this molecule was rapidly metabolized uh, 
uh, by the body. And so in order to preserve good concentrations of nirmatrelvir, they put in an additional drug, ritinavir, to inhibit the me metabolic process and make uh, nirmatrelvir the drug that it is. <clears throat> this again reminds me, to re reminds me, and I think should remind you too, that the drug discovery process is really pretty complicated. And there are all sorts of ways that things can go off the rails or, or, or end up beyond getting a great molecule to uh, inhibit the enzyme making it beyond those steps to getting a, a drug that's really gonna work. And so here we are back again, just like with Pseudomonas aeruginosa at the stage where all sorts of other issues besides the inherent activity against the target um, uh, critical biological mechanism, in this case, M-PRO, are important. So the molecule's gotta be absorbed. It's gotta get to where it needs to go. It can't be metabolized too quickly, can't be excreted too fast. It can't be toxic to other things within our body. So these are issues that are ongoing and will be uh, probably addressed in future generations of molecules besides nirmatrelvir. So now we know you need to have ritinavir present. Could we come up with a, a molecule that inhibits M-PRO but doesn't, is more metabolically stable? That would be an, an indication of one possible variation uh, on this molecule. There are also some toxicities <clears throat> associated with Paxlovid that prevent its use in people who have compromised kidneys. So these are two things that will tell us that sooner or later, we're gonna have things to take the place or supplement right in, uh, near Mitrelvir as active things to treat uh, COVID-19. And that's what we're involved in doing. So how are we gonna look at this in a new D3 project, which we've developed here at IUPY to find alternatives to near Mitrelvir? Again, We'll, we'll take an advantage of what everybody else has identified as the, the critical portions of the molecule. I'm calling them the bait portion. And now we're going to preserve them in a whole series of, of amides, simple primary amide derivatives. We're gonna accept the fact that, that we're gonna keep the uh, conformationally restricted <clears throat> lactam residue. But we're gonna look at all these positions off to the left from the P2 residue all the way down to the P3 residue as alternative sites to maintain uh, activity gets M-PRO, but pro provide us with perhaps some leverage, both in terms of uh, physical properties, but also in terms of metabolic stability. So this will be the goal. The primary amide is just one step away from the nitrile hook. So we'll make first in our undergraduate labs, the primary amide. We've shown that our students and undergraduates in our independent group can then take this molecule and attach the hook to it. So here's the lab that we are carrying out. We've been carrying out this lab now for two years, uh, but it's gotten more sophisticated along the way. And the current lab has us only targeting primary amides at the very end of the synthesis. In earlier labs, we had various other amides and there's reasons why we did that that I can't discuss now. But now we're having our students only make the, finally the primary amides because we know we can easily convert those into the nitrile hook. So here, here's the steps in the synthesis. We give the students, we make for them a large batch of the starting material, which already has the conformationally restrained glutamine in it. They come into the lab and they conduct a four-step synthesis. Uh, they take off the Bach group. They have the free amine. They now put in our combinatorial variation of, of substituted amino acids here. Then they take off the Bach group and then they put in a combinatorial selection of, of acylating groups here. When that's all done, they do a cleavage step with ammonia. What ammonia does, the ammonia comes in and it cle attacks the ester bond to the uh, merophile resin and makes a simple amide. At the same time, cleaving it from the resin, they now have these vials over the uh, reaction tubes, over the, the collection vials, they collect the material, and we go on just like normal organic synthetic chemists, characterizing what's in that vial by LCMS and uh, the students purify these samples. Here is the grid. So this is what the power of combinatorial solid phase chemistry can be. Here we have a, a single lab. We've just finished this lab last week and we already have, I'll show you some of the LC traces of these things. But here's the combinatorial uh, grid of 60, not 60, of 30 
different uh, analogs of near Mitrelvir. And what you'll see is in a combinatorial sense, on this row here, we all have the same capping group as the final uh, R3 group, but we varied the R2 group in, in, in this kind of uh, cyclic structure fashion. We maintain the cyclic structures for the next row, but we have a different capping group. Again, same cyclic structures, a different acyleating group, et cetera. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six different acylating groups, and we have five different um, conformationally restricted leucine-like analogs over here. And that gives us our total 30 compounds. Plus, we always insist that the students do at least make at least two molecules. And so one of the molecules they make is always the same. Everybody in the lab, all six sections that we just carried out, all made this control molecule. This is interesting because in fact, this was a key intermediate in Pfizer's discovery of nirmatrelvir. So we can directly tie the students into making a molecule that was a key component of uh, Pfizer's discovery of uh, uh, nirmatrelvir. Pfizer converted this into the nitrile and that became a key molecule in the SAR that was published in science. <laughs> so that everybody's making. And then you, you can see here, here's the structure of near Mitrelvir. But look at this particular row. We just took the, uh, we can per commercially buy the uh, acylated trifluoroacetyl uh, acylated uh, t butylglyce and give that to the students as a starting material. So they make molecules. If you look closely here at number 12, you see that it's identical as the primary amide precursor to the nitrile here. It's identical to near Mitrelvir, except it doesn't have this three member ring up here. So, you know, we're open to serendipity. We'll make all these closely related analogs of near Mitrelvir and see what happens when we develop our M pro assay and test these things. So that's the lab. And just these results are just coming out. Um, we've confirmed in earlier labs the power of this general process, but with this specific lab and these specific uh, combination of, of groups, uh, you see here, here's the control molecule, really pretty high quality for a student who's never done solid phase chemistry before, never conducted on basically 15 milligrams of starting material, a multiple step synthesis. This is a molecule and every student is making that same molecule, that's the control. That allows us to make it a traditional lab where we know, know that the students have learned the skills and carried them out appropriately. But at the same time, they have one other uh, of those 30 molecules that they're making in replicate. So here's the replicate. So one student's LC trace of this particular molecule, another student's LC trace of this particular molecule, essentially identical. I'm not showing you all the results here. They're just coming off. I'm guessing, you know, not everything's going to be as pretty as that. Is the, as this is, but from past experience, the majority will be. So that's uh, what we're doing. That's the actual series of molecules that are being made in this COVID lab. And we've shown that our students can take the primary amide and convert it into a nitrile. We've done this with POCL3 too also, but we don't feel comfortable having our undergraduates, uh, second semester organic chemistry students use POCL3 so we do this with our independent undergraduates under closer supervision. And we've already shown that they can take, for example, they take that control molecule that I showed you. And then we've shown that we have uh, a, a couple of undergraduates can carry out this, successfully carry out this transformation and purify the, the nitrile and have that key molecule in uh, Pfizer's SAR. So our vision here with that in place and having shown in multiple uh, sections of the laboratory that we can carry this out, is to take this on the road, just like we took on the road, the, the uh, unnatural dipeptide uh, synthesis procedure, just like we took on the road, the reversal of reagents, to take this lab to other collaborators who will be interested in participating and making many, many more analogs of the, uh, well, ultimately of near Mitrelvir, but of molecules that could be inhibitors of MPRO and potential drug candidates down the line for treating COVID-19. Uh, we'll approach Santa Clara, obviously Colorado, they've been in Goshen, real active. Again, Poland, University of Puerto Rico, Cuba, 
uh, Mexico City, other participants recently active. And I'd like to finish up with this by saying, reminding you again of this process. So here we're our goal, which we believe we're, 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 we're quite well at accomplishing now, is to get involved global students to learn both synthesis and biology. By the way, in terms of the biology for MPRO, we are still at the uh, intermediate stage of developing a simple enzyme assay so that we can have the molecules that are made tested. Um, we're not the experts in enzymology that we are in chemistry. So this is going a little slowly, but we hope within the next two or three months to have in place an MPRO assay, which could now both educate our students in enzymology, but also test the molecules that you've just seen here. Um, but uh, we, we just think this is just a wonderful way to involve students in more than just making something that's always been made before and showing them the relevance of what they're learning to these processes. And I've got to say that my, my hope is that when this war is ended, um, that we will have an opportunity to help you uh, rebuild in whatever way is appropriate. But one of the ways that may be of interest would be to, to adapt things like the, the D3 process and involve students at Taras Shevchenko National University in projects such as the COVID-19 project. So with that, uh, I'll end the presentation and acknowledge uh, my two key collaborators here at IUPUI, Dr. Marty O'Donnell, and Dr. Gino Samaritoni. Dr. Gino Samaritoni is the war horse. <laughs> You know, he, he's running these six sections of laboratories and teaching these students how to do these things and running an independent undergraduate group. And he has been essential to all the work that we've done. So at, at that point, um, I'd like to thank you again for your attention and, and just say, boy, I hope we can be a positive uh, uh, part of this healing process after the war is over. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Oh, Alex is already connected to us. Just before your lecture was coming to an end. So thank you very much for uh, all these uh, three lectures that you have gave us. And for this particular one, I'm sorry that I couldn't attend it, but I hope that the listeners uh, had a nice time here. And if there are any questions, so please. You know, perhaps we shall. Uh, I shall uh, check if there will, will be any questions on YouTube, since I don't see any hands now. Uh, so, uh, and and if there will be any, and we will pass them uh, to. Uh, Bill, so uh, of, to, to, to all that, uh, to all of us that, of you that will be watching this uh, video in record, uh, know, please know that you can ask uh, additional questions if you are interested in. And with that, uh, I will like, would like to send you Bill right once more. And you're welcome. Hope that you will have an opportunity to give this lecture or other lectures. Maybe lecture. I can. I listen all this lecture on behalf of okay. uh, Dr. Grigorenko ask me. Uh, so it's a wonderful lecture, and I hope that uh, students of uh, Kiev uh, National Trust of Chenko University uh, will join to this project <laughs> with a great pleasure. It's Thank very. You. Very interesting lecture. Thank you. Thank you, William. Thank you. Okay, with that, thank you to all of you that uh, who participated in this lecture and uh, see you next time. So I can stop uh, yeah. recording, yes? Yeah. Or you already?